historian Kathy Thomas. All right. Please pay the most earnest heed. Good afternoon. Welcome back home, everybody. It's good to see all of you. The Word Reunion is defined as the act of being brought together again in unity or as a unified whole. One of the best ways to build unity is to have opportunities when we come together to catch up on times past, rekindle friendships, and learn about our ancestors and celebrate their past history. So as our motto says, building unity within the old love community. So hopefully we can do a little of this this weekend. But before I continue, I'd like to thank the Old Bluff Reunion Community Organizing Committee for giving me this opportunity to make this event, for giving me this opportunity and making this event possible. But I would like to thank you, the people of the community, for coming out and making this reuni reunion a success. All right. My name is Dina Harris Pullen, and I'm married to Ronald Omawali Pullen. I've lived in White Bluff most of my years until relocating to Florida, where my husband took on a new job. But most of you know me as John Francis, Paul Pop, and Greta Harris's daughter, who lived right up the road in Nicholson. First, let me say, I hold this place near and dear to my heart. I'm proud to be from White Bluff, the Bluff, as we affectionately call it. You should know our history is very rich and very connected with African history, American history, and Georgia history. That's right. I'm not talking about Savannah. I'm talking about this area, White Bluff. Know that many of our ancestors gave their lives upon arriving on American soil in the struggle for freedom. White Bluff is located on Savannah's south side it is a community made up of several communities, Nicholson, Twin Hill, Cedar Grove, Coffee Bluff, White Bluff, and Rose Dew. Due to the cruel period of African enslavement, much of our people's history has been lost, but I will share with you some of what I have compiled. Before the Civil War, the South was dependent heavily on slave labor. Wealthy cotton and rice plantation owners valued the slave who once farmed rice in the grassland and marshes of Africa hundreds of years before they encountered the Europeans. The plantations along South Carolina and the Georgia coastal line thrived from slave labor as rice became a profitable export crop. As a result, many slaves were kidnapped from the west coast of Africa and forced into slavery where they were shipped down the rivers to coastal U.S. ports. In the 1700s, a brutal voyage known as the Middle Passage, where 12.5 million Africans were shipped across the Atlantic Ocean to the New World as part of the Atlantic slave trade. It's us people, that's your ancestors. In the last years of the century, Georgia officials enact laws to restrict Savannah's involvement in the Atlantic trade, slave trade. In 1798, the state legislature banned the direct importation of Africans. However, this measure only led to illegal slave trade that persisted for many, many decades. A typical slave ship contained several hundred slaves with about 30 crew members. Upon boarding the ship, the captured Africans were stripped of their belongings, branded, and sent below deck. The slave deck itself was a living nightmare. The slave captors, captives were normally chained together in pairs to save space. That's the males. Right leg to the next man's left leg, while the woman and children may have had a little bit more room. Many of the captured slaves were kept shackled throughout the entire journey, oftentimes lying in each other's feces, urine, and blood. They were fed one meal a day with water and treated like cattle. 
When food was scarce, slaveholders would take priority over slaves. That meant they would get the meal. The duration of the voyage varied, but could last anywhere from one to six months, depending on the weather. Some estimated that over 10 million of our people died during this voyage to the New World. Mm. Half of those captured jumped overboard, some died of diseases, some died of suffocation from lying on top of each other, many died of starvation, and some simply gave up and died of the feeling of hopelessness. Mm. The Middle Passage was a horrific experience for the Africans. From there, cargoes of African slaves were brought to ports along the southern United States and the Caribbean. Here, they were placed in pens given plenty of food and encouraged to exercise solely to make them look attractive for the auction block. Not everyone agreed with the practice of slavery, and in 1768, it was illegal in Georgia to import slaves from Africa. But plantation owners saw slavery as necessary to keep their workforce growing, and the deep waterways of coastal Georgia and the barrier islands offered shelter and good harbor for this trade to continue. Life on the sea islands at Sapelo, St. Simon, Osobar, St. Catherine's Island was a brutal and traumatic experience for the slaves. Slaves had the job of converting the island to cotton and rice fields. This meant draining the marshes, cutting down huge trees, clearing stumps, all while being bitten by all kinds of insects encountering poisonous snakes, and huge alligators. Many of the slaves tried to escape, but were later captured. Slave life on the coastal plantation came to a sudden end with the Civil War. As Union ships blocked the ports of Savannah and Charleston, plantation owners fled the islands, taking with them the healthiest slave, leaving the elderly and the sickly behind. But as the Confederacy collapsed, Many of the healthy slaves escaped and joined General Sherman and his troops as they marched through Georgia to the sea. While in Savannah on Thursday, January 12, 1865, at 8 o'clock p.m., General Sherman attended a meeting organized by President Lincoln's Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton. They met with 20 of Savannah's black clergy to discuss how to help former slaves make the transition from slavery into freedom. One of those clergymen was Alexander Harris, age 47, freeborn in Savannah. Yes, this is the same Alexander Harris that was the pastor of the historic Nixon Borough Baptist Church. Following the meeting, Sherman drafted an order called Special Field Order Number 15. In this document, dated January 16, 1865, Sherman ordered the islands from Charleston South, the abandoned rice field along the rivers for 30 miles back from the sea, and the country bordering the St. John's River, Florida, reserved and set aside for the settlement of blacks who were now made free by the acts of war. According to Sherman's order, each family should have a plot of not more than 40 acres of tillable ground. At the time, it was acceptable, acceptable that 40 acres of land was the size for a family farm. General Rufus Saxon was put in charge of administering the land along Georgia coast. While Sherman's order mentioned 40 acres, there was no mention of farm animals, so General Saxon however, did apparently supply some overworked U.S. Army news to some of the families that were granted land under Sherman's order. News of the 40 acres and a mule spread quickly. Free slaves welcomed it as proof that emancipation would finally give them a stake in the land that they had worked so hard as slaves for so long. Thus is the origin of what we know as 40 acres and a mule your ancestors. Three months after Sherman issued Field Order Number 15, the U.S. Congress created the Freeman's Bureau, which was supposed to ensure the welfare of the millions of slaves that were being freed. 
One task of the Freedmen's Bureau was to be the management of land seized from those who rebelled against the United States. The intent of Congress was to break up the plantation and redistribute the land so former slaves could have their own small farms. Tunis Hammond was appointed superintendent of the Freedmen's Bureau of the Major Lands of Osawa, Saplow, St. Catherine, and St. Simon Island off the coast of Georgia by General Rufus Saxon, who was a military commander of Georgia. He was appointed, people, appointed. This is the same Tunis Campbell described as on the historical marker, located at the head of Old Coffee Bluff Road as a self-proclaimed governor. But contrary to the description on the marker, Tunis Campbell was a highly intelligent and well-educated African-American. He was a devoted abolitionist and missionary. In 1865, he was appointed military governor of five of Georgia's Sea Island, where he provided schools for free blacks and, became, and began implementing Sherman's order of distributing land to blacks. In 1867, Campbell was appointed a voting register and he bought a plantation in McIntosh County where he used it as a home for free blacks to the white bluff community. Our factual history is important. It is crucial for us to make every effort to correct this marker because it does not do justice to our history or the work of Tunis Campbell That's right. in developing black freedoms during Reconstruction. His story deserves to be told factually and accurately, and I charge this community with the task of correcting the historical marker with a truthful description of Tunis Campbell and his contributions. Oh, That's right. As with the Native Americans' betrayal, the U.S. government reneged a year later on its promise to the former slaves, our ancestors. President Andrew Johnson revoked the 40 acres and a mule. He ordered the Union Army to drive out Camel and all the former slaves off the island. As the U.S. government gave back the land to the plantation owners, Tunis Campbell and the communities of former slaves fought back and resisted. But the U.S. military was called in to control, give control of the land to the white plantation owners. Some blacks stayed but many moved from the island to the mainland. On January 18, 1868, the Savannah News Herald reported that 200 to 300 blacks leaving the islands and were believed to be bound for the White Bluff area, mm. your ancestors. The White Bluff community grew out of the turmoil of the last year of the Civil War and the last years of Reconstruction. Life in the Old Bluff was ruled. Many of the residents work hard and live on what they could get from the sea and what they can grow in their little garden plots. They worked hard to purchase land for churches and live and land to live on. They took pride in their community and there was a strong sense of community where everyone looked out for everyone. Mm, that's true. Cultural ties were sprinkled throughout the community. Many of the people spoke a Gullah type dialect which is a combination between English and other languages spoken on the West African coast. Some of the African customs such as fishnet making, basket weaving, and wood carvings were preserved, but a lot has changed from the early days. Many of the families have died off, many of them have moved away. As property values increased, much of the property that was once predominantly owned by blacks has been gobbled up by large subdivisions. Look around. Mm. In conclusion, in the words of the Jamaican singer, songwriter, Bob Marley, we are the survivors. Yes, the black survivors. And I'm certain that our ancestors had hopes and dreams of future generations preserving the bluff. Keep in mind, our ancestors fought hard, struggled long, and painfully sacrificed so that we, you and me, could have this little corner of the map we call the bluff. With that being said, I'd like you to know that land is power. And in closing, I'd like to leave you with a quote by Marcus Garvey. 
of people without the knowledge of their past history, origin, and culture is like a tree without roots. I'd like to share with you some pictures. This is what a slave ship might look like. This is what it might look like on the inside. Those are slaves lined up. Like sardines. Like sardines. Here's another picture. And this is what the males would look like, side by side. Here's a picture of Tunis Camel. Here's the document, 40 Acres and a Mule. Good reading. And here's special field order, a copy of special field order number 15. Read your history, people. Thank you. Kathy, would you come up and finish? Well done. Thank you. Good job.